Welcome to CS284 Windows Network Security. I am your instructor Robert McMillan and we are going to talk about the intro to network security and go over our first lab together. So let's take a look. So why should we worry about security? Well increases in both online connectivity and online malware, increases in banking infrastructure attacks, all these different things uh, make us uh, should make us a little bit more worried about what's going on in the area of security. Everyone is talking about moving data to the cloud, but we have no idea who is securing the data that's in the cloud or even where the data exists. Also increases in password generation power by using GPUs instead of CPUs. Well, a CPU runs the computer, the GPU tends to run the video, but you can use that GPU to do automated scanning and use penetration software and also password generation uh, guessing tools to do all the work for you and it does it much more efficiently. While the CPU runs the computer, the GPU can run all the hacking tools. And of course, more complex software increases the chances of vulnerabilities and exploits. Not all software systems are patched right away. Uh, most programmers are not all that efficient. Many of them copy data from each other, copy code from each other. A lot of them work at night when there's not a lot of good support and there is no education requirements to even be a software programmer. That has led to software programmers causing much of the problems that we have uh, in the world with online identity theft and uh, other things. Even uh, It's even caused problems during wars such as the time when Russia invaded the country of Georgia. They used uh, various different vulnerabilities that were in the Georgian computers to shut down their networks while they attacked them uh, using various different arms. They had no way of communicating with each other. So it's a, a very dangerous type of community that we, we have created by putting everything online. Attacks and tools have become more sophisticated, altering behavior to avoid detection. So a lot of people are becoming more educated, but also more confused uh, of, of, over the choices and the proper behavior. So a lot of people just don't know what is considered safe and not safe, even though they become more educated about the different types of malware that's out there. The more we move everything to computers, the more valuable our data becomes. So that's creating a target. And when we create a target, you're going to have some people that are going to be shooting for that target. It used to be that just financial institutions and hospitals were the big targets, but now uh, anybody can be a target because any single person can have uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars in credit available to them that uh, can be used by attackers. If you look at how much uh, money was stolen from people last year by hackers, it adds up to about $1 trillion. And $1 trillion is more than most countries' gross domestic products for an entire year. So what is information security? Well, it's protecting information systems from harm stemming from direct or indirect events. It's also maintaining integrity, confidentiality, and availability of data and systems through products, people, and procedures. So maintaining integrity and confidentiality is a big part of this. Obviously, you want to make sure that your data is kept confidential from hackers and also not corrupted from, by hackers. And you want to make it available. Well, one of the new hacks that's out there, new viruses, is one that encrypts your data and charges you to get it decrypted. And uh, a lot of people are losing their data because they can't come up with the money or they come up with the money and the hackers don't give them the keys to decrypt their files. That's availability as well as confidentiality. And uh, the data and systems through products, people, and procedures, that's what we're here to actually take care of. What products do we use? What people do we trust? And what procedures do we take? We'll be learning that in this class. So part of that learning has to do with vocabulary. Find out what each of these different terms mean. Now in the, uh, the word asset, it can be, mean a lot of different things based on uh, what it is you're talking about. Now since we're talking about malware, we're talking about data security threats, an asset is something of value. If this item were destroyed right now, how difficult would it be to be replaced? 
So uh, an asset in, is data for the most part. It could also be a computer, it could be a tablet, it could be a phone, but really it's the data on those devices that is expensive as these devices all become commodities and become lower and lower in cost. Threat, an action that can cause harm to an asset, both direct and indirect. The threat agent is the vehicle to carry out the threat. That could be a zombie-infected computer. It could be uh, a computer that is directed by a hacker, maybe going through a proxy to try to hide uh, the location of where that person is. And it could be uh, various different devices, such as a, a laptop, tablet, a phone, lots of different ways, you know, lots of different things could be the agent. Vulnerability, manner in which a threat can be implemented. A vulnerability could be an unpatched computer. It could be a program that has a hole in it. It could be a lot of different things. And the exploit is taking advantage of this vulnerability to implement a threat. So uh, if you're going to exploit a vulnerability, then uh, you would do so in order to gain access to a system that you shouldn't have access to. Now the risk is the likelihood of an exploit taking place. So often risk equals the threat times the vulnerability times the cost. Uh, so a lot of companies make this decision as to their risk and based on this type of formula. If they feel that the risk is too high, that means that the threat is too high, the vulnerability or the cost or a combination of all of these things. And once you get that, uh, that number after going through the threat, vulnerability and cost, then you can either accept it and just say, okay, I've got a risk, I'm gonna accept it, it may or may not happen. Diminish it by going in and hardening your systems or transfer that risk to someone else. And uh, that could mean various different things. One of the ways that could be, would mean that uh, if there is a risk, you can transfer that off to maybe a consultant and give them the risk. So if there is any kind of a, a, an attack that gets, them, uh, get, gets through and steals data, then the consultant would be responsible for it for not hardening uh, the system. So let's go through some examples. The term, an asset, a physical example may be a car, but a virtual example may be a database of payments. A, the term threat, blowed up, it could be theft or alteration of files. Either they could steal files or they could alter files in order to cause issues. The threat agents might be an environmentalist in the physical world, but in the virtual world, you're looking at hackers or disgruntled employees. A vulnerability could be uh, public access, etc. So maybe you have a website that has sensitive data on it. Physical access, virus, unpatched software. Uh, that would be a, a real, a virtual example of uh, you know, physical access, such as maybe you have um, a, an unpatched computer, or maybe you have a webcam that people can connect to from the outside through a, uh, a wireless connection or maybe a virus comes in and causes data to be stolen or lost, etc. Exploit, uh, such as a C4 under a car, a rag in a gas tank. A virtual example of an exploit would be to take and copy a drive, maybe take a drive off site, propagate through company holes and that kind of thing in the, uh, in the company. A risk, uh, unlikely, it could be low to high. Well, it's, if you look at that previous slide and look at risk, the threat times vulnerability times cost, uh, that determines your risk. Either it's low or it's medium or it's going to be high. So why do we care? Prevent data theft, thwarting identity theft. That is a big one. It, this can ruin your life uh, and the, in the life of your company if you have data being stolen. It could also put your employees at risk as well. You want to avoid legal consequences. There's all kinds of privacy laws. So if you have customer data information, such as credit cards, social security numbers, then you have a requirement by law to keep those safe. And if you don't, then you could be sued not only by the customers, but you could also uh, have issues with the law by breaking these particular privacy laws and end up in jail or lose your business. Of course, you want to uh, maintain productivity. That would be an, a thing that we would want to care about. As soon as your business is no longer productive, then it's going to start losing money. Nobody wants to lose money. Foiling cyber terrorism. Of course, we want to get the bad guys, put them in jail. So that would be a great reason to care. 
So you have to ask yourself, what reasons does your industry have to maintain security? So that the place that you work, you think about, you know, why is it that we need to be secure? And maybe we should have that conversation uh, with the various different department heads at, uh, at our companies. Let's look at the types of attackers. Attackers are knowledgeable techs who test known and unknown vulnerabilities and exploits on systems. They realize that uh, lazy programmers are creating these programs with all kinds of holes in them that, uh, unless they get patched, are going to be vulnerable. So they look for these types of holes. Sometimes they create the holes themselves by being the programmers and leaving backdoors in the system. The attackers use both pre-built and self-created software. So sometimes they use software that other people built and sometimes they create it themselves. They differ in motivation, white hat versus black hat. So a black hat attacker is one that's out there that's going to try to cause damage in order to maybe get financial gain or, or revenge, whatever it is. A white hat attacker is one that will try to hack into a system because they're being paid by the customer to see what kind of vulnerabilities they may have that could be exploited. Attackers can be part of a research, military, or criminal groups. Uh, of course, Edward Snowden was working as a contractor for the NSA when he took all the uh, secret information from the NSA and, and made it public. So it could be you know, a contractor, an employee. It could be a lot of different uh, things. It could be the military of another country, uh, such as what Russia did to Georgia or what China is trying to do into the United States all the time, hacking into our Department of Defense. And of course, it could be criminal groups, although governments like the Chinese government government are criminal. Uh, you could also, uh, you know, reach into maybe what uh, former KGB agents, which are now uh, very ex expert uh, criminal groups that are uh, into hacking networks and things like that. From anywhere in the world, this can happen. Then you have the less sophisticated script kiddies, and uh, they use information uh, that the attackers uh, create. So they'll take a lot of the uh, exploit programs that the professional attackers create, and they will go in and they will try to uh, tweak it just a little bit, just enough to make it work differently, maybe make a virus work a little differently so it's not going to be detected by anti-malware software. And they can do this a lot and over and over and over until they get what it is they want. They have various different uh, motivations. Some are altruistic and, and uh, some are trying to you know, protect uh, other people and others are just trying to do it to cause trouble or maybe for financial gain. Spies and insiders, most dangerous could be the disgruntled employee. They already have partial access into the corporate system. They may feel the company owes them something. Maybe they didn't get the raise they wanted or the uh, promotion that they wanted. So they have lots of different motivations. Uh, these things can also be profiled. So if you're trying to figure out who it is that's causing a problem, you may hire a profiler or maybe the police will bring in a profiler to figure out who it might be based on uh, th their recent actions, uh, the recent statements to other employees. It could also be cyber terrorists. They uh, typically belief motivated attackers. They attack uh, attacks often result in defacement and shutdowns, that kind of thing. And they act or react in seemingly random fashion. So uh, they may be you know, people that are trying to prove a point. They may be people that are trying to get a company to stop uh, stealing or cheating people. Um, they, there's maybe a, a government involved that uh, the cyber terrorists believe is exploiting the citizens. And uh, that could be a cyber terrorist. So defacements, it's a lot of times this happens where they go in and they'll attack a website site and they'll put whatever beliefs that they want to express to the public into the website until the website is taken down and fixed. So attacks and defenses. Uh, you start out by gathering information, scanning, gaining access, maintaining access, being obscure, but maintaining access but being hidden, and then of course covering your tracks. Make sure that you are uh, you know, not caught. So in other terms, that could be layering, limiting, diversity, different ways of doing it, obscurity, hiding, and simplicity. The, the simpler, the, the better. So let's go ahead and take a look now at our lab one. And we are not going to make any changes to our host computers. 
we are going to download and install VMware Player or VMware Workstation if you choose to get that from DreamSpark. If you choose to the, get the player, you can go right to VMware. Just go ahead and open up that link and then download and install the VMware Player Plus for Windows. If you're using Windows 8.1, you will have to uh, use the VMware Workstation. And VMware Workstation and Player are both installed on all of the lab computers at the college. So once you download and install that particular product, you're going to want to for, download from DreamSpark the Windows 7 professional version. Make sure it's the professional version. Uh, from DreamSpark and you do not need to activate the Windows 7 because the class will be shorter than the activation period of 180 days. Make sure you give the memory 1024 or 1 gigabyte and you change the network adapter to NAT so you can go out to the internet and download the various programs that you'll be doing. After each lab make sure that you do a snapshot in VMware player of your virtual machine so that way if you mess it up because we are going to be installing a lot of tools on your uh, virtual machine that so uh, make sure in case you mess it up you can go back a version and get things going again without having to reinstall the whole OS but even if you do have to reinstall the operating system that's not a real big deal it takes you about 10-15 minutes to do so and you'll be able to get right back into it in case one of these tools breaks your virtual machine we do not want to make any changes to the host computer uh, because uh, if that happens and you break your host computer, then you really can't complete the class. So you're going to be going in your uh, book, The Security Plus Guide to Network Security Fundamentals, and you're going to be going through Chapter 1 on these different hands-on projects and then the case projects. If you have any issues downloading any of the tools, make sure you get with me right away, and I will uh, get a, the tool to you in one way or another. Once you install... The VMware player, you'll be able to go to VMware player, open it up, create a new virtual machine, and choose the ISO file from DreamSpark. Now, if you download the ISO file uh, using Google Chrome, sometimes it changes the extension of the file. So you may have to go in, right click on it, and change the extension back to .iso from whatever it is they use. If you use Internet Explorer or Firefox, it doesn't do that. So once you choose the installer, then you choose next and you do not need to put in a key you can uh, call the computer anything you want it doesn't matter it's not not important uh, what you decide to call it uh, and then you can choose the windows operating system in this particular case i have the uh, 2008 here so i'm going to go ahead and choose the windows 7 one instead and then windows 7 professional and you make sure you put in a password. I like to use pa the word password with a capital P and a zero. And you can choose to log on automatically. And I did a typo on the first one there. There we go. Choose continue. The default location is fine as long as it's good for you. If you have an external drive, you can put it there. Maximum disk size, you could shrink that down to 20 gigabytes or even 10 gigabytes would be fine. And you can leave the either as a single file or multiple files, it really doesn't matter. And then you can go ahead and choose finish. And then after that, the installation will begin. And then you'll have your Windows 7 virtual machine. Make sure you change it to NAT, like I said earlier, so you can get out to the internet. And then you can make all your changes to your virtual machine and then turn in your labs. Uh, as screenshots. So let's scroll down here to the submission. Make sure that uh, your screenshots are all pasted into one document that can be saved as a PDF, a .doc, or a .docx format. And then just upload that right in, uh, right into Moodle and into that particular module, the LMS. And I'll go ahead and grade that for you. Each one of these particular submissions are worth 100 points, so it's a big part of your grade. So that is it for our first module, Module 1 on CS284 Security.